You work here, so you have you have a studio at home, mm -hmm. uh, but you're also obviously producing a lot of the work out, out yeah. on the wing of an aeroplane, yeah. Arizona, and that kind of thing. Um, tell me about uh, the the difference between the production of work within the studio that is a, a, a space as this is, you know, that is um, separate from the world and yeah. defined space for creating art compared to making it out in a site that is not yeah. a studio as such. It's funny, I, I didn't really realise that I'd made that shift into the real world, into the outside studio world, um, which is kind of, again, I, sometimes I'm a bit slow to catch on with what's happening in my own practice but it wasn't until I was unrolling that 30 meter print around the world that I suddenly thought oh I'm there are people watching and there's people asking questions and so that sudden shift from what is the quite quiet and you know self-contained and you know a space in which you can imagine it to be exactly what it's going to be in a studio I don't know I it was suddenly quite daunting and then of course the next thing I was in Arizona working in this boneyard and then the work I did after that um, was down the Fremantle port and then um, this one. So it wasn't until a couple of weekends ago when I'd actually been making a piece of work in my studio for a show um, which didn't involve going out anywhere that at the end of the weekend I'd spent two whole days on this piece of work and I had the music on and it was beautiful weather, it's really lovely and calm and and I got to the end of the weekend I thought god that was fun, what an amazing experience that was and I suddenly went oh that's right because I wasn't getting hammered by the southwester winds and I wasn't getting beaten by the sun and it suddenly was like oh <laughs> I haven't done that for a while so it's, it was quite a nice experience being back in that sort of familiar space of a studio. Um, but then you kind of lose that. I, I really do enjoy the um, the sort of serendipitous stuff that just unfolds when you're out in the in the environment, and that's what the work's about. But having said that, these take months to prepare before I go out in the studio. So there's lots of repetitive, mundane gessoing and buffing before I leave before these works go out to be made. Um, mm. So I've kind of got that luxury of. Of both, and I guess coming from a printmaking background too, I don't have presses and screens, you know, screen machines here, um, so I use the ones out at Curtin. Um, and I guess that, in a strange way, is sort of out of the studio. You know, you're in the public, and so I was sort of used to that. Um, I guess that space between the public, public, and private of studio um, already. But yeah, this, and I, I have to work through problems by doing as well so my studio's always just got little sort of ideas everywhere just that I can return to later and you know that's that they'll never go away I think I think I because yeah well and again with the work that I made in Arizona you've got to commit you've got to then you know I pack up this thing and I take it with the paper in and that's it you know you can't return and go oh I stuff that up, I better get some different paper or, oops, I've got the wrong sound. You know, you've got to go with it then. So you've got to do all the testing here in the studio to know that you've got the right stuff with you to take to the other side of the world. How do you, how do you find that preparatory stage? The prep stuff? Yeah. Um, as I, I, I think I love to overcomplicate things, so I love that testing in the studio that so I wonder what happens if I do it this way or and you know I'll then do it at grand scale and then I'll realize it didn't work so then I'll do it again and so I love that wondering and finding out by doing um, in the studio then once I've nutted out that yes it's this formula of gesso or it's that mix of whatever um, then it's just a hard slog <laughs> you know gessoing 300 pieces of paper to take to Arizona is just you know it's nothing glamorous, it's not sexy, it's just fucking hard work. <laughs> does, does your mind kind of 
Yeah, then I'm... Well, what's going through your head, oh, I suppose? That, that is actually interesting. It's thinking time. It's great thinking time. I mean, it's digesting, you know, your day and what you're having for dinner. It's that sort of thinking time. But it's also... Um, it's sort of an, attentative, an attentiveness to the practice, which is which I enjoy, you know. It, and I have music on some days and other days I have complete silence and I just think through things. So it's a, it depends on where I'm at with the process. But yeah, sometimes it's just a slog, you know, you just mm. fight 50 more before I go to bed and I'll just, you know, stand over this thing, <laughs> gesso another 50 sheets, so it's, yeah. But I think it, I just, I love that testing um, and, and you know creating problems that then you try and find out ways of fixing and you know that that sort of tail chasing part of a studio practice is is forever stimulating and I don't think I'll ever you know stop complicating things and possibly over complicating things mm. yeah, that, that, that I suppose leads me on to my next question which you've half kind of answered anyway mm. but this is a question I usually ask uh, in these interviews as well which is um, to what extent is the is the doing, you know, uh, within the studio part of the thinking process? Oh, or so much of it, you know. It's, I mean, having said that, you asked the first question about you know conceptually where does it come from? Um, I think it's always a beautiful toing and froing between, you know, this the the thinking and the reading and the looking that you you do um, as a practicing artist and. Um, and then the, you know, the, the thinking through the making, um, and they're always shouting at each other, whispering occasionally, but mostly shouting. Mm. Um, yeah, I, yeah, and I get stumped sometimes, you know, yeah. really stuck, and then it's it has to be a you know waking up at two o'clock in the morning and just thinking it through because I can be impetuous overly impetuous and just try and fix something because I'm you know want to get on to the next thing and that's usually disastrous so it's I have to just put the brakes on and you know yeah but yeah do you ever do you ever get to something um and it it doesn't it doesn't work mm. have you had a particular mm. <laughs> occasion where you can look at that yes that I mean happened. I think yeah. this isn't working yet. <laughs> this okay. is, um, yeah, that, and this has been days, I mean weeks, it's been, you know, the prep and then the driving up to Geraldton and back and, yeah. and it's hard, you know, I can't see it properly on this wall because it's not big enough and it's got gaps between it and so, you know, sometimes I have to forgive the things that I don't like or think are not working because the environment's not ideal here. Um, but again, sometimes it's just time I have to sit with something. In fact, I made a big piece of work on all these camp tables. I had, um, I can't remember how many it was set up here for a, a big work. Um, and it was hours and weeks and weeks and weeks with this very fine drawing on them. Um, and it just was awful. I mean, I honestly, I spent weeks and weeks and well, months on it actually. It was huge and very complicated. And again, it was looking at Indian Ocean Drive, so this up the, and down the coast. Um, and I had a deadline for a show for it, and I sat with it, and sort of getting grumpier and grumpier, thinking that this is just not working, and I, I don't know what to do with it. So I actually ended up bundling all the camping tables back in the car, and I drove up to Geraldton, because I thought, right, I'm just going to take them on the very drive that I'm interested in. Yeah. And I stopped, and I took each of them out, and took photographs of them, and sort of looked at them in the landscape, and kind of scratched my head a bit. And then shoved them all back in the car and drove home again. And it's it's not a it's a it's quite a long trip, way. You know? <laughs> Six hours. Um, <laughs> and then I brought them home and dragged them back out of the car again. By which time they got more scuff marks on them and and shoved them back up in a different order. I went ah oh, okay. And it just sort of it revealed itself through yeah. I guess by just thinking and doing it. I find ironically travel time really good thinking time. So it was just, and I think that's sometimes it's a matter of patience, you know, time, thinking, and in this case, travelling with the actual objects to try and make it work. Um, but I ironically had to take them out of the studio to make it work, which was part of the work anyway, because they're yeah. camping tables and they're about mobility and transience. And so I had to kind of do the very thing conceptually to them, materially, that, to make it work. Yeah. So yeah, maybe this has got to go back up to Chilton again. <laughs> no, can't. 
I could get in a box and go to the Eastern States in a minute. So, but that that's that's kind of interesting because I, I um, one of the one of the things that you know interviewing uh, the artists of the years that I've uh, become aware of is um, many artists will have a studio mm -hmm. that is often half an hour away from home uh, because there's there's a kind of a separation yeah. not only a separation between the two spaces but but um, often there is a kind of a gestatory mm -hmm. sort of half an hour of between. thinking time between the two yeah. things um, and you're here you know in literally your house. Yeah. In, in your home yeah. um, and it's almost, you know, just thinking about the, uh, driving to Geraldton, it's almost like, you know, okay, I'm maybe now going to give myself. Yeah, yeah. That, that space, maybe it is. And I, I mean, we're really fortunate in that I've got the studio here and Bevan's got my studio in the garden. Mm -hmm. And the kids are relatively independent. Um, but yes, it's whatever you need to make something work, I guess you try and find that. Um, mm. And yeah, not everything gets fixed in the studio for me. Um, not everything is resolved in a studio by any means, it's, yeah, it, and you know, even that one where I did it around the world and you know, I was on the road for three weeks, there was no going back to Bermuda to fix it, you know, I just had to get it to work and when I brought it home and eventually rolled it out, all 30 metres of it, not in the studio, um, I just went, oh, what is that thing, it's just so, but again, as a rolled up object, it's where I don't get to see it, I get to think it. It's a really interesting work, but as a, as a visual, I don't know about it. So yeah, some things... So were you not necessarily satisfied with... I look, it's, it, it's, it's interesting, but it's not, you know, I don't find it aesthetically engaging or it, it just... And I don't think I ever expected it to be. Um, uh, yeah, it's... I like it rolled up in its little kind of box that it is, you know, it's still got all the stickers on from mm. being dragged through things and you know there's a, there's a certain kind of presence that it has um, and it's called the round the world print you know I just I kind of guess that it it feels like it stays I've shown it a couple of times and um, it's only been able to show you know five meters of it in and that's probably its best it sits its best like that yeah it's, it's kind of interesting though, I mean, when you look at uh, things like yeah, that, no, that. imagine that, you know, if it's encased in something like that, mm. it, it, um, that travels well, that does. It, it seems to almost work, I, it, I just kind of think of someone like Piero Manzoni's mm. lines that he does, and then they're, you know, they're then encased in yep. these, uh, these cylinders that are, are locked. Yes, you know. I know, that, sort of, yeah. that container, that vessel, and I mean, the nice thing about working on these this scale um, map is of course they pack to that size and then you mm. travel with them very easily and then unpack them one at a time to do the work and then to send them to shows they pack back up into that very same box i kind of like that mm. you know it's not like they when you make a piece of work that's 16 meters long which is the one that's down in the show in frio um you think shit what do you do with a 16 meter piece of work but it just packs up neatly like you saw on the table you know it's just this little stack of pieces of paper mm. paper is wonderful and that's the other thing too i have to confess is i'm a complete you know paper is probably the foundation of my practice i think it kind of it appears again and again in all its guises mm. that and that's sort of the two steps forward one step backwards printmaking sensibility i think you know paper and printmaking are even though you know, this is kind of a print, but I think that, um, yeah, finding out what you can do with those things, the, the, so the process of making work with a sort of printmaking sensibility and paper as a, as a vehicle. Mind you, they're cam tables. Mm. <laughs> now tell me, about, um, tell me about the work that you, tell me about the work that you've been developing for the SPAN exhibition ah. at Fremantle yeah. Arts Centre. So, there's two works um, that are going to be in the space, in the show. Um, one is uh, a full rubbing of a wing of an aeroplane called a CRJ, so a, a Canadian regional jet. Um, and it's a complete wing, so it goes from the wing tip um, and across the wing to the body of the aircraft. Um, and it's similar to this, so it's black gesso on um, maps of the Great Sandy Desert. Um, 
that have picked up every rivet and sort of bolt and emergency sort of hatch and things on the wing. Um, and it's a formidable, formidably large work because a wing's a large thing. Um, so it's about 13 and a half metres long by, I don't know how wide it is. Um, and it's probably a hundred or so sheets of paper. And for this show, um, which will be the first time it's been shown because finding a gallery with spare 13 metre walls is tricky. So it's mm. really exciting to see it for the first time. Um, Rick and I, the curator and I are talking about actually um, not hanging it on a wall, uh, but actually hanging it in the way, in the situ that the wing itself would be so horizontally and potentially with the tip, you know, going up a wall. Um, so it just sort of hovers almost at the height that you might imagine seeing it outside of a, an aeroplane window, but you can still walk around it. And I think that shift from taking it from a horizontal back to a vertical plane will be quite an interesting thing. And again, that sort of interest in the bird's eye view of the landscape and the wing is this, you know, planar thing. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing it in the space. And I'm, we're thinking maybe a kind of a darkish space because um, they're quite... As much as I don't mean them to be, I think the black gesso has this quite sort of slightly formidable and almost gloomy feel to them. And because they're mm. a reverse frottage, the, the wing itself is actually quite skeletal. It's quite, it's it, because the white emerges from the black, it's almost like an x ray. So That's exactly, yeah, you know, when you show me the wing, yeah, that's exactly what I thought it was. Yeah, like, um, yeah. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't the intention of it. I mean, I knew, I'd done all the testing beforehand that that's what happens. but seeing it um, in its sort of parts where it's it's got this sort of quite almost forlorn and mm. but again it was an aeroplane that was about to be munched up by a massive machine and turned into aluminium cans you know it was it was on its last kind of gasps of breath in this world as an aeroplane um, mm. so I'd, I don't mind that that kind of reading that comes with them and unexpectedly but nonetheless the that particular project came out of this interest in mobility and stillness so you know finding these aircraft that were stationary and then being able to be stationary on them um, and yeah, the frottage being that sort of proximity and again it's talking about the environment and the kind of atmosphere of working in these sites um, that particular work has got lots of evidence of the really harsh atmospheric conditions in arizona because you know, a wing is a hot metal object um, and you're in the Arizona desert. Mm. And so it was onto the wing at about seven in the morning before it got too hot. And by midday, I mean, my knees were just blistering from the heat. So mm. it was tough, we had to get off by midday. Um, and then towards the end of the two weeks or 10 days that we were there, the, um, it was freezing, completely howling winds. And you know, you'd take a piece of this carefully, you know, gesso paper out of its beautiful box and the wind is just ripping out in hands and so yeah it was there's evidence of that on this wing and it's mostly sweat on the wing because it was just so hot and of course the gesso then turns a bit um, tacky when it gets so hot on the metal um, so when you're sanding it it sort of balls off rather than sands mm. on so again all those sort of tactile sensibilities of working in the field are kind of evident in that work so there's the wing um, and, and also when you think about the, the distance that you would have had to have actually travelled to get to Arizona yeah. in order to do that. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly, I'm in conversation with um, Ian Howard who did mm. the, the Enola Gay rubbing um, 30 years before I did mine. Uh, yes. He was saying that with one of the aircraft that he was working on, it was a completely unexpected, he thought he had it for X amount of hours or days or whatever and it was completely changed, it was the wind came or something. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see with him how that plays out visually in the work as well that, you know, the limited access time that you might have with something. So, yeah, I think that's, um, I just guess it's with any artist who works in places or at times that you only have a limited amount of access to it, how does that reveal itself in the work? Mm. But certainly with the wing, I think it, you know, there's, again, just it's sheer exhaustion by the end of it. It's kind of, it's somewhat sort of... How long did it actually take? The wing was only four days, but it was, you know, it's it's not fun. Mm. It's, um, and sanding black gesso, it's just rank. I mean, just mm. covered from head to toe. I've got some oh, fun gosh, photos yeah. of standing on the wing, just completely <laughs> black and sweat in everywhere. And anyway, yeah, it's, it's not, wasn't, that wasn't fun. There's so when, when we were having the conversation the other day and the, 
the topic of performance Ye came up. That's yes. what. Uh, I know. I yeah. I um I have to. Yeah, it's it's something that's unexpected is the, the fact that this is somewhat performative when you make work out in the field. Um, mm. I mean, the aircraft boneyard was slightly different in that it's obviously a controlled space and. Um, there were only the workers who were there who were obviously letting me in and driving aeroplanes around for me. Um, and so it wasn't actually out in the public, so to speak, but it was still, you know, they were still intrigued and came to chat and would sort of come over and have a look. And and the, when the weather was too bad and we had to move into the hangars, um, they were great. They'd come and, you know, check out what we were doing and having a look. And, you know, so I think in that sense, it, yeah, performance, strange. I didn't think I'd make work like that. <laughs> mm. And then the other work is um, similarly a rubbing um, and I've been very interested in um, that idea of mobility and stillness but this particular work is a rubbing of the gangway um, that connects a cruise ship to the port. Uh -huh. So it's like this sort of transient space that happens that you don't usually stop and linger in because you're usually going you know from port to cruise ship or vice versa. Um, and they, I've always looked at them down in the Fremantle port. And in actual fact, when I arrived on a boat once from England with my parents, we would have come down that very same gangway because they've got oh, wow. they've got a number yeah. of them down there. Yeah. And I've always been drawn to them as objects, but then this potential to actually stop and be holding bits of paper up against one for you know it was for I can't remember how many days it took. It was quite a long time. Mm. It's sixteen meters this one, so it's huge. Um, it was really interesting, you know, actually to then be still with this object that is usually about that transient thing that happens between holiday, cruise ship, and port, you know, home. Yeah. Um, so it's a rubbing of a, of a gangway, um, and yeah, it's about 16 metres long. And again, the access times for that were interesting. I made it in um, April this year, and it was still pretty hot in the morning, so you'd get this easterly beating, easterly sun beating down on you. and and we only had access between 7 a.m. and midday. That was sort of when, you, and you could only use it when the cruise ships weren't in. And so, you know, negotiating those sort of practicalities is quite interesting. But because this particular one, um, the irony is that despite the fact I'm interested in stillness, these things actually would move over the duration of a cruise ship being in town. So mm. I'd set up all my lines and my markings to, you know, for the end of the day to then come back the next day. I'd come back the next day and a cruise ship had been in and it would be completely moved around to a different location. So this particular work has got some really nice kind of glitches that happen where things don't line up between the, um, the rubbings. Mm. And I think that's actually what makes the work interesting is these little slippages because it's a very linear long kind of formal object um, and where you see the slippages they're quite dramatic and I think it's kind of got that sense of duration and yeah, the fact that these things kept on moving on me was really intriguing.